We hope you enjoy this episode of the Modern Divorce Podcast. But first, an important message for our listeners. Embarking on a new chapter, Zach Nutzman of the Darwin Wall team at Realty One Group is your go-to real estate expert in Arizona, specializing in guiding couples and families through their real estate needs while experiencing a divorce. Modern Law's trusted partner, Zach, brings expertise, confidence, and compassion to your real estate journey. Let him help you navigate this challenging time. Zach Nutzman, your modern solution in real estate. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Modern Divorce Podcast. I'm excited about this one, joined here by a local influencer and celebrity and really one of the faces of the anti-trad wife movement, Jenny Gage. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. I am more excited to be on your show than any podcast or interview that I've literally done this entire year, and that's not a joke. So no, you've been you. doing a ton, right? Like you, you're on the you're on the circuit. I think I have three today. Wow. <laughs> so you're you are the one that I'm the most excited for because I think that you have provided so much help for me, and I'm really excited for all the tips that you're going to give to my followers and yours. And anyway, thrilled, Billy. I'm thrilled too. I'm thrilled too. And we need to get real and raw. And there's so much to talk about here. Can we start with your story? What's your background? My story is really <laughs> simple, really. I'm, I'm just a basic little Mormon girl who grew up in the 70s, living in that little ideal family bubble. I spent most of my life, I'm from Scottsdale Paradise Valley, Arizona, and then um, part of my life up in Portland, Oregon, my mom and dad relocated up there for a little bit and went off to Rick's College when I was 17, thinking that I wanted to be an international trade attorney. Got a really rude awakening when I discovered that Heavenly Father wanted me to be a wife and a mother and not an attorney. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I got I got married really young. And honestly, as generic as it sounds, like my whole entire life story is I was living the Mormon dream life. Um, having babies and, you know, building all the Mormon McMansions. I lived in Gilbert and Mesa and Scottsdale and all the places and just raising babies and doing stuff. And then five years ago, I'm actually called Life Take Two on TikTok. And um, that's my social media handle is Life Take Two because that life that <laughs> the, the Mormon Mecca life all of a sudden came to a screeching halt unexpectedly when my ex-husband decided to abandon his family for somebody else. I was 44 years old at the time. And it was like when like Ron Howard yells cut <laughs> and then like, let's do this all over. All of a sudden I found myself in this totally different act of my life, living a very different path. And I didn't have a script for it. And so that's kind of led to where I am today. Um, I'm now a domestic violence advocate. I write, I have um, a Substack, a book that I'm working on. And I, like you say, I'm the antithesis, like I'm the anti-venom to the trad wife lifestyle because I have a whole feminist movement that I'm part of empowering women and girls to live more responsibly. And anyway, not to lead to where I was today, but I will say, Billy, that having that whole life stripped away from me and then cut in the middle of it, And finding myself unscripted as an ex-Mormon, ex-wife, homeless, (laughs) everything completely devastated, not knowing what to do. I have rebuilt in beautiful ways. And today, as problematic as my life is, as I still kind of try to untangle some of those things from my past that weren't the best decisions, like not having a job or any education, um, I am totally happy and fulfilled, have skills like furniture flipping and (laughs) things like that, that I never, craftsmanship that I never anticipated having and happy, fulfilled, figuring things out. So how many kids do you have? Um, My followers are always confused because sometimes in my videos, they say five and sometimes I say four and sometimes I say seven. (laughs) I had four biological children and then adopted one because I didn't quite have enough kids. I Four kids was not enough in my Mormon community at the time that I was having children. And we adopted one, but then when I had an almost deadly ovarian tumor, my sister-in-law adopted him from us. So then we went back to four. And my partner, Kevin, that I've been happily blended with for the past five years has 
three. So I have four bio children, three bonus children, and a daughter-in-law and beautiful grandbaby. So I don't know, Billy. Right. I never know how many kids I have. Got a lot. It. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, and how old are they? My oldest is 27. I had him when I was 23 years old. And my youngest bio is 14. And then my partner, Kev, has three that are right in between mine. So he has one that's 13. So I have in total from 13 to 27 and a two-year-old grandbaby that I'm responsible for. Wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. So a lot, a lot, a lot of kids, a lot of stuff. Um, your experiences are so varied. So how, what is it about your story that has made you such a ardent advocate for women and so opposed to this trad wife movement. Can I start this with an ask, Billy? You can't judge any part of my story because I know that you lived a different life and there may be things that you're like, what? I promise <laughs> so, I won't judge you. Um, I think that the big thing about my story, first of all, what I lived is very relatable to a lot of women, especially if you're in Gilbert Mesa, Utah. When I talk to people from maybe like Philadelphia, Chicago, or other countries, they haven't normally had the same experiences that I had. But I was raised very traditional. So that whole trad wife term is traditional wife, traditional families, traditional moms and dads, and really kind of like living out the embodiment of the Norman Rockwell picture with everyone sitting down together at the beautiful dining table and grandma at one end and the Thanksgiving turkey. That was my life path. A lot of women relate to that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people relate to that. A lot of people think that that's like the ideal family. And I did everything. All of my decisions were based on making that lifestyle come true. Thinking that it was sustainable. Thinking that it was safe. Thinking that there was no, like, there was no possibility that that could possibly go wrong. Like if I was, if I was building a family and working on my relationship and the little picket fence and everything, what could go wrong in that? It's, it's foolproof. That's the safest lifestyle to live. And that's very relatable for so many people, but I didn't understand the ways that that could go wrong. And I got in, like, I was so clueless even about people getting divorced I had such a sheltered life that when my marriage finally fell apart and I was 44 years old and I knew that I had to get divorced, I didn't even have friends who had really been through divorces. And I had to find somebody that I had known when I was 20 on Facebook because I knew that he had divorced and remarried and reach out and be like, what's it like to get divorced? Like, were you lonely? <laughs> like, how do I file for divorce? Um, I know that you're remarried. Is that weird for your kids? I literally didn't have any example in my life of people who'd been through that. And I was completely clueless. So I made decisions that I just didn't have anyone telling me those may not be the healthiest decisions for you. Things so like not finishing college or ever having a job after age 19. Well, and I've listened to enough of your stuff to know that it's not that you just bought into this. You felt like you were commanded by your faith, religiously told, if you have faith, if you love God, if you want to get to heaven, this is what you must do. So it's a little bit more than just, I thought this was the way to do it. It's a little bit more pressure than just that. I'm so glad that you said it like that. In a lot of ways, I didn't feel like it was a good idea. Um, from the time that I was a young girl, I actually had career goals. I had aspirations. I wanted to build my own life and my own future. I remember, Billy, in kindergarten, we had to do this little class project. They had like this career week and they had like some moms and dads come in and like the dad who was a... Um, a police officer and a mom who was an artist. That was really cool. And all these people came in. And then at the end, we had to write this little teeny kindergarten letter. We could barely even write about what we wanted to be when we grew up. My dad at the time was an anchor man on the news and he was really into politics. I think that Ronald Reagan was the president when I was in kindergarten. And I wrote on my little thing, I want to be the president when I grow up. I'm going to go into politics. And I brought that paper home and I had a little picture of myself being the president and showed it to my parents. And my mom, like, got teared up and she was like, Jenny, 
Don't you want to be a mommy? That's what Heavenly Father wants you to be. So from the time I was very young, I kind of had this conflict of, I want to do things besides just like change diapers. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have my notifications off. Um, sorry, Billy. But I want to do things besides just be a mom or maybe do both. And it was reinforced again and again and again that your purpose in life is to be a wife and a mom. If anyone's interested in Googling this, and Billy, I don't know if you've ever looked this up yourself since you live in Gilbert and you're surrounded so much by the LDS culture and religion. But in 1995, the prophet of the Mormon church, at the time, I think the Mormon church was about 7 million members worldwide, had an official statement. So this is the same as scriptures. Like if, if Jesus himself like wrote an extra verse to the Bible, this carries the same weight. It was a direct revelation. It was canonized. It was accepted as official doctrine of the church. And it's called the family, a proclamation to the world. And in this official thing, the prophet said that before we even came to earth, we were male or female, that God created us like that. And that women specifically were designed to nurture children. And then period, that was the end of that sentence. <laughs> and women are to be providers for their homes. And 1995 was the year that I got married. So I get married with this new revelation from God, a new chapter to the scriptures, a new verse to the scriptures that says women are just supposed to nurture children. And I was trying at that point, I had bought a windshield business. I was trying to be like the career woman and be married. I'd only been married for like a month when that came out. And my Mormon leaders squashed that pretty quickly. Yeah. Like they told you specifically to stop. It's even more intense and direct than many other religions. I was raised Catholic and participated in the Catholic faith. And there's certainly the same kind of, I guess, feelings, but they're not orders. Nobody would ever come to me and be like, Billy, you're screwing up by opening your law firm. You need to stop. That's what happened to you. Yeah, <laughs> directly. And the way that that happened for any of my Mormon listeners, if you want to know just a few more details in a really short story, my husband and I had to renew our temple recommends. That's your little pass, your ticket to get into the Mormon temple. You have to go interview with first your bishop and then your stake president, who's kind of like a cardinal, like the stake president is over maybe 12 Mormon wards. So we were living in Gilbert, Arizona. It was the Gilbert Neely stake. And we went in to talk to President Straddling, who was like 70 years old. And we were just there to get our temple recommends. I had at that point a six month old son and Billy, I loved my life at that point. We had built a brand new house right behind the Gilbert water tower. One of those first little desert shadows mm -hmm. neighborhood in there. Joe's barbecue wasn't even built yet. I was 22 years old. We were making money hands over fist from my business that I had bought um, I woke up in the mornings, we had an office in our home. So I woke up in the mornings, took care of my baby, and then I'd hand them off to nannies and I would work on the phones all day and do marketing and all this stuff that like as a 22 year old girl, so fun. And our business was really successful. And then after work, we would go to the park with the baby. And on the weekends, we'd go on camping trips and take our ski boat out to Saguaro Lake. And I was so happy, of course, church on Sunday. So I sit down for this temple recommend interview. President Straddling asks me, what do you like to do all day? I told him, I run our windshield business. <laughs> like, like I like to hike. I like, I'm, you know, but I run our windshield business. He just gets this look on his face, like what? And he said something to me, you know, obviously I don't remember the whole conversation. This was 1995, but he said something to me about, I knew that your husband, I knew that Brother Green had a windshield business, but I didn't know that you worked for it. And I said, I own it. It's mine. <laughs> he works for me. And my stake president said, Sister Green, have you, did you hear the family proclamation was read from the pulpit in conference? It was the women's conference. And have you read it? Have you memorized it? Have you emblazoned it on your heart? Um, yeah, I read it. I heard it. And he goes, Billy, he goes, here, let me, let me have your husband come in really quick. Cause my husband wasn't there for my temple recommend interview. My husband sits down. He's like 26 years old. We're totally blindsided by this. He says, brother and sister green, the family proclamation has commanded women to stay home with your children. Will you accept my invitation to fast and pray this week about this was his quote. I will never forget it. Phasing sister green out of your business. 
so that she can obey the command to stay home. And I'm like, but I buy my home. I have nannies. I have all this stuff. And I don't know how we got swept up. And it's like, I guess like, yeah, if that's what Heavenly Father wants me to do, like I, why, who am I? I'm not God. So that week we fasted and prayed about it. The next Monday, my 16 year old sister showed up in a pair of boxer shorts and a t-shirt with her big gulp. And she took over my job answering the phones and we eventually would move into an office and people would replace me. And I would literally work for free in my own business for the next 22 years so that I could obey the commandment to (laughs) not work. I just, I wish that everyone could hear this story because this is like religion can be so dangerous and it can also be so beautiful. I I watched um, the Netflix series on Blue Zones. These are people who live to be centarians, and they are greatly and wonderfully benefited from having a religious faith and a religious community. There is something very, very good for the soul about religious faith and religious community. And there is something so dangerous And what you described is the ugly, ugly, ugly side that we must dismantle because it is so bad. And I think it's bad for men. And I think it's bad for women. I think it's the antithesis of what any God or creator would want for any individual. We're not all the same. Men and women both suffer from high demand religions and from these patriarchal structures and power structures in general, like the men don't do any better. And on my TikTok and my social medias, and also on some of my podcasts and things, I try to also highlight my sympathy for my ex-husband's experience within the religion. Like on that day, all of a sudden he's like, uh, Jenny does everything. I ran the entire business Billy, I'm so sorry. Did I just glitch again? It's okay. Um, okay. Hold on. You'll edit that out, right? The other question I want to ask for you is why hasn't the church then taken care of you after your husband abandoned you? Isn't that the promise? Um. So a lot of people think that, but... As somebody who was in a Relief Society presidency for many years, the church actually has like this this three-step plan for helping people. So first, teaching you your own self-reliance. So, you know, like, Jenny, what can you do for yourself? What if you go get a job or something? Um, Secondly, turning to your family. Can we just stop right there? Wait a second. How are you supposed to be living the commandment of taking care of your child? And that was what God created you to do if you're now being told to get a job. That is incredibly hypocritical. Something that a lot of people don't understand about Mormonism in particular, and I know that this also applies to some of my evangelical Christian friends that I talk to in some different Baptist sects, is the concept that a woman shouldn't work just for pleasure, like to buy a boat or the fancier house or just self-expression, but it is okay for a woman to go to work in case of emergency. So some of the teachings of the Mormon church in particular are if your husband is disabled or let's say he gets leukemia or something, or after September 11th, when the economy kind of tanked for a little while, things like that, then it would be okay. Like heavenly father would be fine with me going to work. But if I just want to go to work so that I can be an attorney or be a doctor, or be an artist just for kicks, that's not my place as a woman. My place is having babies and staying home. Okay. All right. So then you were telling me about this four-step process that the Mormon church uses to determine if they're going to help you. Yeah. So it's three-step. So the first is that self-reliance. What resources do you have that you can tap into? This is why your Mormon friends all have food storage because the Mormon church teaches self-reliance. So if something goes wrong in your life, so for instance, me going through my divorce, my bishops, even though I had just walked out of the Mormon church and was on my way to becoming ex-Mormon at the time of my divorce, um, my my bishop, soon to be my ex-bishop, sat down with me and went through, what do you have that you can sell? He had me pawning diamond rings. I pawned my wedding set. Like, how can you take care of yourself is number one. And then number two is your family. This for me during my divorce was so humiliating. And in hindsight, I should have just cut ties completely with my Mormon bishop, but I needed him. And my bishop, Bishop Schnepp, um, 
sat down with me and like, we need to call your mom and your dad. We need to call your, you know, ex-father-in-law and ex-mother-in-law. And then what about your sister-in-law? And what about your sister? Is there anybody that you can ask for like $500 to help towards your rent? Um, is there somewhere that you can stay? They turn to the family first. And for me, my bishop literally made sure, like he checked in with me the next week that I had had those conversations with people before he even considered then like, let me help you with a little bit of money for food and send you up to the district or the um, bishop storehouse to get some groceries. And my Mormon ward did not help me with any resources at all. They knew that I was becoming homeless, literally moving into my car, no home. My children were couch surfing. I sometimes hung a hammock in the park, sometimes would sleep with friends at their homes. They knew that I was losing my home and becoming homeless and they helped with nothing. They didn't help me move. <laughs> they didn't help me with any more groceries. They didn't help with anything. So, but in the perfect scenario, they would have gone through that first. What can you do for yourself? Then what can your family do for you? And then if you have no other resources, the church will step in and help in certain situations. But in yours, they didn't. They did not. And that's partly complicated by the fact that two weeks before my marriage ended, I walked out of Mormon church at age 44 and I've never gone back. So <laughs> got it. You were done. In hindsight, I should have picked one, like leave the Mormon church after the divorce or I should have timed it different. Yeah. Both at the same time was probably really, really good. <laughs> so what have you done to be able to climb out of homelessness how have you supported yourself and your children Billy it's been so hard first like right after my divorce um I was my my ex-husband was still working for the family windshield business he had a significant family and I was actually working in the business but I wasn't getting paid for it I was just supporting him as the general manager but then I eventually transitioned into having my own small salary right before divorce. And upon the marriage ending, he ended it <laughs> with another woman and having to file for divorce at 24 years. We'd been married at that point for 24 years. My youngest child at that point was eight. Um, he fired me from my job. He had the partners force me out and I had no job at all. And that was, I'd only had this little job for like a year. So it was my first job ever, and I got fired from it the day that our marriage ended. And I thought, like, I have all these cool homemaker skills. Like, I've learned organization, and I'm really good with this and that, and I'm sure I can find some type of a job. So I put together a resume, and I hit the streets and had absolutely no job offers whatsoever. Like Billy, I applied for like, I bet I can answer phones in a chiropractic company. Like I would answer all of these job and people are like, you're 44 years old. You don't even know how to use basic computer systems and other windshield businesses. Like I knew how to do a little bit of this and that for a family business, but I had never gone to college and had any type of business degree or anything and didn't really know how to do a complete job and really couldn't have been capable of doing much of anything. So my first job was working in a little elementary school there in Gilbert as an assistant to a teacher. And our monthly expenses at that point, I was still in our condo down by the civic center over there. Um, my monthly expenses were $4,600 a month. I had two children in college full-time, two children living at home, and I made $11 an hour. $44 a day that didn't cover anything no. and I wasn't getting any money from my ex-husband um one of the complicating things of course if I'd had you for an attorney then everything would have been different but I had a terrible attorney and I had a husband bent on not paying anything so I didn't get a settlement we were renting our home we didn't own our vehicles he withdrew all of the cash from the bank account and my attorney never recouped any of that. So the day that my marriage ended for me to leave domestic violence and the whole big mess, I walked away with literally zero. Um, I do videos about this all the time on my TikTok to born women, like two days after my husband abandoned me and our children, 24 years into my marriage, I went to the Trader Joe's up there on baseline 
and swiped my little debit card. I only had $43 worth of groceries. I had like two little bags, like some milk and something and little machine bleeped at me declined. And I called a friend, somebody Apple paid me some money so that I could buy my groceries. I drove straight to our bank and he had withdrawn everything. And the day that my marriage ended, I went from high six figure, almost a quarter million dollar year income through my husband to zero and eventually $11 an hour. And that's a hard place to be in with all those kids. So I have spent the past five years hustling, <laughs> like, because I don't have a law degree. I don't have anything. I, you know, I don't, I don't know how to be an accountant. I don't have a teaching certification or certification. Then there was a pandemic in the middle of everything. So I've just been hustling. Um, about two and a half years ago, I was sitting in a parking lot um, looking in my phone to see, I'm always sitting in the parking lot, checking my bank account to see if I have enough money to buy groceries. And I didn't, I only had $60 left in my bank account and I had to pay some bills, but I was in front of um, a thrift store. And I was like, you know what? I know how to paint stuff. I'm going to go see if there's something in this thrift store that I can buy and flip. And I bought some little wooden bunk beds, came home, cleaned them up, used some white paint. By that afternoon, I had made a $200 profit. And I started a furniture flipping business that has actually paid. It's a good side hustle. It's not a good like full-time job, but I flip furniture. I eventually got a commission-only sales job back from the windshield business after um, my ex-husband got himself fired so that he wouldn't have to pay alimony and child support. Um, so I do that. I have social media. I get paid sometimes for speaking events and things like that. And I do a lot of you know, sponsored things on my social media. That's also a good little side hustle, not a good full-time job. And I just actually started with the law firm um, that I'm partnering with to help victims. So that's a brand new job as of three weeks ago. So Billy, if you're counting, that's four side hustles. Plus now number five, um, I work for a multi-level marketing um, product company and I have for 15 years, of course, because I was Mormon. So five jobs. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay, so a couple questions. I want to know more about what you're doing with the law firm. That sounds very interesting. Um, this is the most like really passion driven thing that I have done since my divorce. And we should talk more about this afterwards. Um, because I'm on social media, I have a lot of people reach out to me with their stories. Some of them are great and inspiring, and some of them are, I have Mormons and ex-Mormons and domestic violence survivors and all kinds of things who I wake up every morning and I have bajillions of DMs about, here's some things that I've gone through. And I've tried in the past three years on social media just to like, you know, smile emojis and hearts, and I hope you get through this. And it's been really frustrating because in a lot of ways, I feel like I don't have the opportunity to do anything to help. Like I want to do more than just send smiley emojis and say, I hope you get through it. So um, the attorney who was behind the Boy Scouts of America child sex abuse case against the Mormon church, um, Andrew Van Arnsdale, his firm reached out to me um, and we have partnered to help the victims of child sex abuse in the Mormon church. So I help them through the process. I do the intakes and some of the assessments. And then I almost kind of work. I know that this seems funny, but I'm, I'm a concierge to help them kind of through the process and be there, just that, that face that they can connect with. What we're hoping to do in a non-class action way, but in just an individual case-by-case -case way, is to be one of the biggest suits against the Mormon church to date. And it's really sad, actually, the numbers of people that we're finding. So who have been well, victims been, of sex abuse inside the Mormon church. Yeah. That's wonderful. Hey there, co-parents. It's Billy Tarasio with Modern Law. And let me tell you about our family wizard, our preferred co-parenting app. It's a game changer. I use it myself. With features like documented calls, secured messaging, shared calendars, and more, our family wizard makes co-parenting smoother than ever. Trust me, I've seen the difference that it can make. Join the over 1 million parents and family law professionals who trust our family wizard to make co-parenting easier. 
ready to take some stress out of co-parenting, head to ourfamilywizard.com forward slash modern law. That is a wonderful, 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 exciting thing because lawsuits do change behavior. They do. Lawsuits make people safer. And it's not so much, you know, money doesn't compensate ever for the injuries that are sustained, but it can help make an institution or a space safer for other people. And it's not even the money, like some of the victims who've already um, had the lawsuits and they've settled, the church is actually apologizing by like representatives either email or speak to directly these victims and to get that sincere apology that we're so sorry that we didn't know that your young men's president or whoever was doing this to a child in our organization is incredibly healing. Like it doesn't make it go away, but it gives you this sense of closure. And this is one of the most important things. Like this is me kind of turning my pain into action that I can't go back and change all the stuff that happened to me or live a different life, but I can help stop this for other people. Um, I kind of relate it to like, if you have, you know, how McDonald's is like individual owners of the different McDonald's and some of them are corporate owners, some of them are franchises. And like this one, McDonald's might have roaches and they might have like moldy hamburger buns or whatever, no heat on McDonald's, but, but like McDonald's corporate may not know because that McDonald's, they're not going to call corporate and say, oh, Hey, we have cockroaches. You want to kind of keep that stuff away from the people at the top in Mormon wards and congregations in leadership, and this happens in all churches, this isn't unique to Mormonism, sometimes things happen just between the bishop and somebody, and that local leader knows about it, and maybe it goes up to the stake president, but maybe it doesn't, and a lot of stuff is kept so secret that Salt Lake City and the leaders of the Mormon church truly believe they have no idea the scope of the abuse that has happened because of their religious institution. And we are looking at cases where, like my question is always, would this have happened if not for the church? If this child hadn't had this leader at this pool party, would this have happened? No, this was because of the Mormon church. And the Mormon church truly has no idea. They aren't even fighting these cases. Like, you know, they don't victim chain. They don't give a lot of pushback. Of course, they're not sure that there's enough evidence, but they are actually very distraught. I, I mean, like I'm putting words in their mouth, but they seem truly, genuinely heartbroken as they begin to see the scope. And that's important because as the leaders of the top see how much there is, then they are implementing changes. Wow. That's impressive and not what I would expect. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is you had this windshield business, at least for the 24 years of your marriage. We're a community property state. You were entitled to half of the value of whatever interest your husband had. Did you not get bought out? No, and towards the end... Um, he was running it under our LLC, but under a family member's umbrella of the bigger organization. And just in general, I think that that was just a bad attorney. Um, my attorney hadn't done family law for very long. I've actually filed an official complaint against him with the bar for a multitude of reasons. And he was officially, um, I don't remember the word Billy, but like, he was told that that was wrong and he apologized. He had to give me an apology. So I had some bad legal representation and I didn't know. And I think that one of the most problematic things for stay-at-home moms like me is that you don't have the money to have the legal representation and counsel that you need because you're a stay-at-home mom. So I have people on my social media all the time, like, why didn't you have a better attorney? Well, how could I? He cut me off. I couldn't buy groceries. I didn't have any money. Like I had an eleven dollar an hour job. There's no like pro bono attorneys. Like every day on some of the social media pages that are like divorce related, you see these poor women like I'm getting divorced after thirty years. Are there any pro bono attorneys out there? Well, Bill, you don't work for free. So as a stay at home mom, like I didn't have the access to the legal counsel that he did, and my attorney just wasn't very good. So I received nothing. Nobody, Nobody. bought me out. Yep. And what about retirement funds? No retirement funds? 
absolutely nothing. Um, he had already cashed out college funds. He cashed out all of any of the um, whole life insurance that we had. All of that was gone. The one thing that we did had, so we were renting an apartment. We were renting our vehicles. We have like rubber made boxes full of camping gear and a couple of Ikea bunk beds and couches and different things. Um, the one thing that we did have was a bank account, but and Billy, you can't judge me on this one. I had never been on his bank accounts ever until the last eight months of our marriage. And that's only because we had been separated for a little bit. And then I moved back in with him and we reconciled right before the marriage ended. And that was one of the agreements that he had to actually put me on his bank account for the first time ever in our 24 year marriage. So he liquidated that overnight when our marriage ended and I never got a penny of that back. So I got some Rubbermaid boxes full of camping gear, a couple of Ikea beds. I did get some antiques and a couple of things that I was able to sell and live off of that supplement in my income. Um, I have some pieces of furniture. It's funny, like I was like homeless, but I had my storage unit full of my furniture from when I was a rich Mormon trad wife. So every once in a while, I'd like drive to my storage unit and like get on Facebook marketplace. and like, I'm going to sell this $1,200, you know, antique mid mod chair and buy some groceries and rent myself a hotel. I still had some of the things from our marriage that were just furniture and odds and ends and a sewing machine. That's it. That's what I got after 24 years of marriage. And you had an order for alimony and child support, but he didn't pay it. Yes. Um, so in to kind of offset the fact that we had no assets to divide, that there was no home or anything like that. The judge awarded me originally in our emergency orders, it was, I think, $3,600 a month. I should have had that number in front of me so that I could accurately. And the very first wage garnishment, the very first day that he's like his whole check, you know, his whole check that week went to that. Um, two days later, he told um, my uncle, who's the main owner of the company, that he was going to quit his job so that he didn't have to pay alimony and child support. And he did. He actually staged the firing so that he could say that he had been fired. And then he was unemployed for a little bit when our divorce. So that was the emergency orders in the months leading up to it. When our divorce finalized, he was ordered to pay 2400 and a little bit of change every month. That was alimony and child support. And then he quit another job. So the only time that I received alimony and child support was the month that our divorce finalized in August of 2018. The next month, he brought me a check for the child support, which was $788. And I believe it was $200 of the alimony, which should have been $1,600. So equaling $2,400. Because of my $11 an hour job, four hours a day, I was completely child support and alimony dependent to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. I asked him, where's the rest of it? When are you going to pay the rest of it? And he's like, I don't have it. I don't have a job. I can't pay anything. Get a job yourself. And it was the month after that, that I became homeless because I couldn't pay my rent. And I found this cycle of, it's really difficult to enforce, enforce things in court when you're right. representing yourself. And when you have somebody who's like, I'm unemployed, I don't have a job and I can't work. Like I spent more money two years ago filing for enforcement than what I personally earned. My earnings that year were like $9,000 and I spent like $9,200 in filing fees, attorneys, consultations, et cetera, and got nothing. He actually wow. lowered the child support amount. So he's whittled away at it over the years. So how much does he owe you now? Um, I actually signed away and you would you would not be happy with this if we had a private conversation. Well, I had COVID and I thought I was going to die. Um, he took me back to court. I didn't have an attorney and it was Christmas time. And he's like, I'll give you $5,000 if you sign away. I think at that point it was 26,000 in arrears. And every time I fought to get any of that money back, nothing was happening. And I was also under extreme duress from him. And I signed everything away, said, I'm done. I don't need your money anyway. And so he no longer owes any arrears because Got it. of me. Don't and he's fiddled down to Too much beating yourself up. 
but now like hindsight's 2020. So now I'm like, oh man, I wish that I had known then what I know now, but I thought I was going to die and then I didn't. So it's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> like I'm tired of fighting. Um, we are almost out of time. I know you had some questions for me. Yes. Oh, I have so many questions for you, but let me make them quick. So first of all, my followers want to know, um, what advice would you give to a woman getting married to avoid the Jenny trap? <laughs> like if you're getting a quick little checklist of you're getting married, make sure that you do this, 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 and this. I think the the number one, the most important thing you can possibly do is make sure that you are always self-sufficient. It's great to be in a partnership. It's great to lean on one another. It's great to figure out how to divide duties and tasks between one another, but not at your own expense later on. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's my, I would say a man is not a plan. He can be your lover, he can be your boyfriend, he can be your neighbor, but he is not your financial plan. Right. So you're a divorce attorney. Like, what about like, don't, what about alimony and child support? Like, why not depend on somebody? You're going to get all that child support. <laughs> right. So, you know, and I know because I see this all the time. Collecting child support and alimony is not a good plan. There's nothing that stops people from doing exactly what your ex-husband did. And it's not the first story I've heard like that. That's It's typical. Also, for whatever reason, I see it a lot with my Mormon clients. It's like there is this just disrespect and almost hatred and such a devaluation for women. I just have seen that in the relationships that I've seen play out when people get divorced. Not all of them. So interesting. Not all of them. Sometimes there are amicable, reasonable, wonderful people who support one another. And sometimes people's families do step, step up. But in some of my most horrific cases, they've been Mormon. I see that too. And I don't know why, but um, that's a whole nother podcast. Okay. My number two question for you. Thank you for that. Um, if a woman is a stay-at-home mom, like ideally be self-reliant, don't stay at home, but I still have a lot. I mean, there's so many women out there. There are a lot of women out there who are going to be a stay-at-home mom. So I advise everyone that I know, so my little nieces and nephews, my daughters, whatever, um, that while you are a stay-at-home mom, they have a salary that they receive every single month for that. Um, I advise $250 a month at least as a minimum. That's just a starting point. It's better if you do five. 250 is actually 3,000 a year, 15,000 every five years. So for me, if I just had a $250 salary a month from Jake, that would have been $64,000 instead of zero. But if somebody wants to do that and set up that salary and or, yeah, that automatic salary from their spouse, and they want to call you and have you set that up for them, what exactly do they need to do for that? Okay. So what you're talking about is essentially contracting within your marriage. Mm -hmm. That would be a post snup if it's done after you're married a postnuptial agreement. And postnuptial agreements are enforceable. It would be a binding contract between the two of you. Um, but I like that better than just a post up that says that promises to pay a certain amount upon a divorce because there's nothing that says that that money will exist. So the best thing you can possibly do is to make sure that you're getting assets and setting them aside. Like you do need an insurance policy, but the thing is an insurance policy pays out upon certain conditions and your spouse may not. So you have to actually secure assets or be building assets for your own security. Thinking about the fact that there is no guarantee. But love, Billy. Love and guarantees. So, so what you're saying is if... If I'm 25 years old, I'm already married and I've decided that we're going to have a baby mm -hmm. and I'm going to stay home. Mm -hmm. If I want my spouse to pay me a salary, $500 a month, whatever that is, I come to you and I ask for a post up mm -hmm. and that post up then like that can designate my bank account is just mine. So that $500 a month that I'm putting in that little security net savings account, when we divorce, he can't touch that. 
the yeah. court will say the post up says that belongs to Jenny and then he can't touch that at all. Right. It would need to be designated as your sole and separate property. It would not, it would need to be not considered community property. So we would okay. need a agreement for that. Otherwise, as you know, any assets that exist when you get divorced get divided. So even if you've been paid and you've squirreled away all this money and you've got $50,000 of a safety net, if everything else is gone, you're going to split your $50,000 savings account unless you have I, this post up. I hear women all the time who say, my mom told me to always hide some money, like scroll some away for a rainy day. But exactly what you're saying, then when you get divorced, then he's going to get half of it. And 50% of that is gone. So a simple post up would protect that. Mm -hmm. And that's super easy to do. That's very straightforward and pretty foolproof in a divorce. You know, I wouldn't say it's foolproof, but if it is if as long as you have consideration, so the consideration is I'm agreeing to stay home and take care of our children and take on these tasks and I'm foregoing the ability to work and therefore this money is going to be my sole and separate property, that all day, every day should be enforceable. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, do you have time for yeah, go, one keep more going. question? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so everyone always says you should have had a prenup and life insurance and have a skill to fall back on. That's the advice that I get from my 10 bajillion followers all the time. Like that stuff would have protected you. I divorced at age 44. I could live to be a hundred. I have a lot of life left. So in your experience as a divorce attorney who sees women get divorced at age 32 or 45 or whatever, let's say they have a prenup and life insurance and a skill to fall back on, but they've never actually worked. Is that enough? Well, life insurance isn't going to help you unless it's a whole life policy with a present value and it's designated your sole and separate property, which you would need to do through that post nap. So life insurance is not helping in the case of a divorce. It helps if, you're, if your husband dies. A skill to fall back on is great, but it must be relevant at the time. So, so you're not just, I got a degree in accounting. You have to continue your CLE. You have to know the software, right? You have to put some time into being relevant at whatever time it is. Like you said, you had skills, but not computer skills. And no office is going to hire you if you don't have computer skills. So you have to maintain those. I think even if you're a stay-at-home mom, you should have a side hustle. And I think that it's just, I don't know, in my experience, you can work that in. There's time and your children can watch you and they can help and they can, you know, learn from you. And then you are learning business and you are making money and you are honing yourself and you're also feeding yourself. Like we all do better when we have something that's ours that not, that is not just caretaking. Caretaking is exhausting. It's exhausting. <laughs> Thankless, that's a, exhausting, yeah. important. And so important. I have so many women who, and I understand the sentiment, like being a stay-at-home mom is work. It is, but it, it is its job. What is, but it's not a job that pays. And so, yes, some, sometimes it's rewarding. Sometimes it's not rewarding, but at the end of the day, it's not going to put retirement money in your account. And um, I have to say, like, I know you're suggesting $250 a month. To me, that is far, 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 far too low. Yes. Like, I just value feel like everyone can services. at least afford that. Value them. And yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I absolutely. A hundred percent. I just know that sometimes some of the people that listen to me are like 23 year olds who like live, you know, paycheck to paycheck, at least start there. I think that your husband can work at Walmart and you can designate with PostNap an account and at least put away $250 a month. That's $3,000 a year. At least start there. Yeah. It'd be better if it's like five grand, right? <laughs> it depends on what they make. Okay. My last question is in your opinion, again, as somebody who sees a lot of divorces and a lot of divorces, I can go to Arizona with all the Mormons and a lot of stay-at-home moms and stuff. What are the biggest mistakes men, women make when getting married? So I guess 19-year-old me and girls like me that will bite them in the butt in divorce court. And then the divorce, I guess, in general. And the truth is that none of us at 19 or 20 or even 25 are the same as when we're 40. And so I think it's almost impossible to truly 
make an informed choice, right? Let's call it what it is. When you get married, you're rolling some dice and you really hope that it's going to work out and you have no idea what that journey or what that story is going to be like. So the very best thing you can do, I guess, is be present and be mindful and watch along the way. Would I be okay now if, if X, Y, or Z happened? Would I be okay now? What would this look like? If this happened, what would we do about it? And even having those discussions with your spouse, you know, will keep the two of you closer and more aligned and partners and build for a better relationship. And the other thing is like, if you can't have those discussions, it's not a matter of if you get a divorce, it's a matter of when. And if you see your relationship going down, you can't have an honest conversation. You're not partners. You're just disrespectful one another, you know, you're not equals, like it's time to start planning way before you get a divorce. Yeah, that's such good advice. And that's so true. Like, I think we get all like caught up in these romantic relationships and it's like, I can't talk about, well, what happens if you don't love me anymore? And so you leave me and I haven't worked for 10 years and we have babies and like, how's that going to work out? Like, you don't want to talk about when you're in that like Twitter pated phase, prenups, <laughs> things like that. But that's um, the best time to do it, right? When that's the best time both... to do it if you're with the right person. Right. Right. Like if like you love sitting... each other, it's going to be a lot easier to say, baby, I would never leave you high and dry. Here's what I would do. And yes, I'm willing to write it down. Yes, I love you this much. Do it. <laughs> do it. And if they freak out and they're not about that at all and they don't want to go for it, well, Send them packing. There's so many fish in the sea. Or you can make different choices. You can say, okay, then I know I can't stay home. I know maybe we're not at this place and maybe we grow together and maybe everything's great down the road, but I can't set myself up to be poor and homeless. I have to always be okay to take care of myself and my children. That's the thing I just want everybody to know. If you have children, you have a responsibility, in my opinion. I, I don't want this to sound harsh, but you have a responsibility to be able to take care of yourself and your children. And if you're not there today, that's okay. What can you do to get there? Little bit by little bit. And I think that's my biggest story, Billy, is that little bit by little bit, like now I can buy groceries for my kids and Brody wanted to buy six pairs of socks the other day. So we got the whole six pack and I couldn't even like buy a jug of milk after my divorce little bit by little bit. I think the most important thing in your little bit of advice here about have those conversations at the beginning of the relationship is you don't just want them to respond back with more words. This is stuff that you need to put into action and make it official. So not just what would you do if we divorced, but then let's have a post-nup or a prenup and let's start putting some money away for me. And I need you to watch the kids two days a week so that I can go to community college and work on my nursing certification or whatever. Like, it's not just words, but these things in the beginning relationships need to take form and action. I love that. Jenny, thank you so much for all of your time and your advice and your bravery in your willingness to be vulnerable and tell your story. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thank you for being here today. Thanks, Billy. You're amazing. Keep uh, making the world safe for women out there. <laughs> you read online is not the replacement for actual consultation with an attorney and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Even if you called in and we spoke to you, you were anonymous and we don't have your details and you have not become a client of Modern Law. However, we would love to speak with you or you should seek out the advice of legal counsel or counseling or any other expert near you. And if you have an idea for a show topic or you need to speak with an attorney in Arizona, you can reach me at info, I-N-F-O, at mymodernlaw.com.